Hello and welcome to the Good Society Forum. My name is Emma Skye and I'm Director of Yale World Fellows and co-host of the Good Society Forum, which is a community of change makers around the world with a common quest to build the good society. My co-host is Nizam Din of the Prince's Trust and a 2019 Yale World Fellow. Niz. Emma, thank you so much and hello everybody. Uh, we've been gone for what seems like forever. It's just been a week since we've seen you, um, but we're so used to seeing everybody that we have missed you. Thank you so much for joining us today and for being part of our community that is dedicated to building the good society. And never have we needed it more than now. We have an online community we would love for you to join on Twitter at Good Suck Forum on LinkedIn, but we have a company page, Good Society Forum, as well as on Facebook. Now you are our community and membership is really easy. By coming along to one of our sessions, you are immediately, immediately a member of our community. So if you have any ideas for future Good Society Forum sessions, please let us know. So the plan for today, uh, as ever, is to hear from our amazing, incredible speakers, and then we will take your questions. But if you do have questions during uh, the bit webinar, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and just to make sure you are all there, you're all loud, and you know what we want you to do, if you could kindly just Go to the chat function um, right in the middle of your screen at the bottom and just type in the city that you are currently in. So we can do a lovely name check of where you all are. Brilliant. So we have um, some of our brilliant regulars. We have Azim from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Atim from Nigeria. Homera and Reese from Barking in Essex. Great to have you. Norma in Hamden. We have Stephen from Lisbon, I uh, love that you're in Lisbon. Uh, Christopher from, from New York. We have Malcolm from, uh, where's Malcolm right now? In Prestwick Airport, great to have you. Itzy in Oakland, Oregon. Bill from London. Dr. Dimas from Jakarta. Roberto from Toronto. Arlene from the Philippines. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Jaji, again, thank you from the Côte d'Ivoire. Um, we're so glad and privileged to have you as part of our Good Society Forum network. So, oh, and David, great to have you from Toronto. We know we have an incredibly rich uh, group of attendees today from around the world. Emma, what's our topic on today? Well, we have seen communities respond to the current crisis in very positive ways. From coming together to clap for our nurses and doctors. We've seen that through European cities. We've seen that in New York to locally self-organizing and providing mutual support to help their most vulnerable neighbors. However, with many groups remaining overlooked, we've also seen the crisis fuel a toxic mix of fear and resentment in some countries, including rising xenophobia, intergenerational angst, and rising tensions between cities and regions. Now, there are political leaders that have used the cover of COVID-19 to foment hostile environments and division, including making use of emergency police powers and using the distraction of the pandemic to repeal existing recognition of minorities. So how do we ensure during these continued uncertain times our commitment to building inclusive and welcoming societies? Now, our first speaker today is Yasser Nakvi, who's the CEO of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, Canada's leading voice on citizenship and inclusion. And prior to joining the Institute, Yasser served as a member of the provincial parliament for almost 11 years, representing a downtown urban and diverse community in Ottawa, Ontario. And in that time, he served as the Attorney General of Ontario government house leader, minister of labor, and the minister of community safety and correctional services. Yasser, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Emma. I, I really appreciate that kind introduction and to Nizam and to the Good Society Forum for, uh, for having me uh, part of this discussion. Do you want me to uh, make a few remarks now? We would love Please. that, Yasser, thank Absolutely you. great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm joining here from uh, Ontario, Canada. Um, in Canada, today is actually Indigenous Peoples Day, 
uh, as part of actually Indigenous History Month, which is the entire month of June, an extremely important month and day for us Canadians in our journey to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, whose land we live on here um, in, uh, in Canada, the Turtle Island, which is uh, the continent of North America. Um, not to mention his Father's Day as well. So I've got two young ones uh, upstairs somewhere. So if there's some interruptions, that's just par for the course uh, during this pandemic. Um, I'm really uh, uh, thankful to the Good Society Forum for including me in this conversation and talk about how um, communities uh, are reacting and um, responding to this pandemic over 100 days in running. I think this is something that none of us were prepared for nor were anticipating the manner in which it has impacted uh, our lives. And I would suggest to you that one of the things that we have noticed by the work that we are doing at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship is that um, the pandemic has really bare, bare lay, um, laid bare, excuse me, uh, the fault lines in our society. A lot of the issues that existed in our society are, I think are that much more exposed as a result of pandemic. And one of the areas that we focus on at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship is around um, racism, uh, xenophobia, uh, the anxiety that, that uh, refugees, immigrants, newcomers to Canada or new citizens uh, feel towards you know, their place within the Canadian uh, society. Um, and this pandemic, uh, I think, is again exposing a lot of those uh, those fears and anxieties and the racism towards those people um, in a heightened light. We just recently did a, uh, a, a poll across the country uh, with, a, with a national polling company called Lager just to um, get a, a temperature on how people are feeling when it comes to um, their place uh, in the society. If I may just tell you that half of Canadians, and that's 51%, or their family members are worried that discrimination and prejudice will increase in Canada because of COVID-19. That's a significant number of Canadians are saying that they feel that there will be a rise in discrimination or prejudice. That uh, fear increases to over two thirds among new citizens, that's 64%, and Canadians of color, uh, around 69%. Uh, so, um, you know, when we talk about new Canadians or Canadians of color, they even more strongly uh, around the prejudice and discrimination uh, as a result of COVID. And, and specifically to prejudice relating to COVID, we found that 74% of Canadians of Chinese descent or origin and 80%, 81% of new citizens of Chinese origin said that they are concerned about taking public transit due to discrimination and prejudice. Uh, that, that number really struck to me uh, around uh, how people are feeling, especially of people of Chinese origin uh, in terms of taking public transit, which is a, a lifeline for many people. It's an, it's an important way of getting to work. Um, even in this environment, a lot of these people are essential workers. Uh, they're doing um, uh, jobs um, from, you know, serving in our hospitals and in, in frontline healthcare to, to doing essential uh, services work in grocery stores and, and other places that are so, so important. So this is the challenge we're dealing with. How we are, uh, how we're dealing with. Of course, there's a lot of work that's been done collectively in, in Canada when it comes to ensuring that um, refugees, immigrants, new citizens um, uh, are don't feel any fear when it comes to what's happening as a result of, of this pandemic. We are doing that work at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship in two ways. One, we have a, a campaign that's ongoing. Uh, uh, for some time actually before the pandemic started around creating what we call a citizen resilience, uh, resiliency. This is most focused on the digital space around misinformation and disinformation around people from different, uh, different backgrounds, uh, especially targeted towards immigrants and refugees. We want to make sure that people from, uh, from those communities are able to uh, um, was, uh, be able to discern what information is correct or incorrect uh, uh, online um, and give them the tools to respond. Give them the tools not to be just bystanders and not just to tune off, but be able to sort of push back uh, if they see prejudicial or discriminatory information uh, online. The second campaign we most recently in, uh, started and it, it was been inspired by what we saw happening in the United Kingdom um, is a campaign we call Stand Together. 
Um, it comes from the whole notion of if you clap for me uh, now, will you clap for me tomorrow? The idea being that a lot of our essential workers are people of immigrant uh, or ethnic, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, they are risking their lives as essential workers to keep all of us safe. Let's appreciate them, let's like recognize them today, but also tomorrow. So we're asking Canadians to stand together with them. Um, it's a hashtag stand together that you can see on our social media platforms at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. Um, and, and really create a movement of Canadians, whether you know, they came you know, five generations ago um, or, or 50 years ago or five years ago. Uh, in terms of recognizing the work um, that these new Canadians are doing not only today, uh, but tomorrow. And our next aim uh, around that campaign is to really look at the issues around credential gaps um, in, in Canada. There's a big challenge around people coming from different professional backgrounds, uh, but not being able to practice in their craft during this pandemic, especially healthcare workers were given temporary licenses to, to practice medicine because we needed them. We want to make sure that they are fully recognized and accepted. Um, I'm sure my five minutes are up, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a snapshot on some of the issues that we are seeing in Canada, which is a fairly open and inclusive society. Um, and the responses, collective community responses that we're developing at the Institute of Canadian Citizenship to make sure that Canada remains an open and welcoming uh, society. Yeah, sir, thank you so much uh, for that. I think it's an incredible start. And, and as you say, Canada is revered around the world for being welcoming and opening and we've heard you uh, state the difficulties even Canada has had and you also rightly said happy Father's Day for everybody who is uh, tuning in and is a father or you know has a father so happy Father's Day to everybody. Um, our next speaker I am delighted to introduce is Dr. Colleen Tuez, Director of Welcoming and Integrated Societies at the Open Society Foundations. Prior to joining the Open Society Foundations, Colleen served for 17 years at the United Nations in various leadership positions, including heading up the UN Institute for Training and Research. Since 2015, Colleen has also served as chair to the capacity building portfolio of the World Bank's Knowledge Partnership on Migration. Colleen is a senior fellow at Columbia University and an adjunct professoral lect a professorial lecturer at American University School of International Service. We're so glad to have you with us, Colleen, and look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Oh, Colleen, bear with us. I think you're just on mute. Uh, let's try and unmute you. There we go. We st uh, sorry, Colleen, we still can't hear you. I think you can hear me now. We can hear you now. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Nisam, and thank you, Emma, for this very kind invitation. Um, I am I'm based right outside New York City, uh, just northeast of, of, uh, of New York City. And as Nisam mentioned, I work for the Open Society Foundation, very much focused on uh, local government and local partnerships um, to respond to the needs of uh, migrants, uh, refugees, uh, and other displaced people. And over the last three months really since March um, with the epicenter of the COVID pandemic uh, hitting New York City um, in such uh, uh, harsh uh, terms, uh, Open Society Foundations uh, were, had started to work very closely with the city of New York in its response. And that response has really been to try and do um, three things. One is to make sure that those uh, New Yorkers who are not, were not going to receive any federal assistance through the so-called CARES Act or other federal um, policies and measures that were put into place, were going to get some relief, some cash um, during this very difficult period. Um, it was also very much an effort to support city leadership, first with New York City, as I've mentioned, um, to make sure that the city is working closely with the um, service providers and non-governmental partners to make sure that um, the cash assistance get, reaches the most um, difficult to reach communities across New York City. And uh, a third feature um, has been to uh, really support and acknowledge some national partners in the US, uh, including the National Domestic Workers Alliance and also Accelerator for America, which are two uh, initiatives with very different mandates, but in both cases um, have come up, have stepped up and um, started to perform this cash assistance uh, work 
for um, undocumented migrants, but but also for other very very vulnerable individuals in in societies and communities. And what happened after the announcement that you may have already seen, since it was um, heavily reported uh, in the in the media in New York City, this partnership between Open Society Foundations and New York City um, was an effort to see uh, which other cities could be supported, not at, at the same degree as New York City, of course, since the foundation has has limited resources, but could help um, spur similar response and um, get other foundation and other interest and uh, attention to the needs of, of similar residents, but in other geographies across the United States. So from uh, Denver to Atlanta to New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, um, a few counties in Texas and Virginia, and, and also a couple of states that have wanted to work statewide. And so over the course of what ends up being nine or, or 10 weeks, we've been working very closely in what's called the Emma Lazarus Campaign named after, as many of you will know, uh, the person who authored the words on the, the, the Statue of Liberty, um, to get um, um, both awareness, um, to mobilize funders, and also to get city and uh, civil, civil society partners within cities responding and getting a cash assistance platform for uh, individuals who were not going to receive and who have not received any federal assistance. Again, primarily undocumented uh, individuals, but also um, gig workers, um, dependents, adults, um, and others in each community. And with the time that I have remaining, I'm just going to draw out three lessons from um, this from this 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 effort that has been underway um, over the course of of the last ten weeks, as I've mentioned, and which. Uh, by the way, we'll, we'll receive some more attention uh, this evening. We spoke about Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all fathers on the line. Uh, John Legend is having a Father's Day special on ABC, on uh, television here in the United States, probably broadcast in Canada as well at 8 p.m. And he will be speaking about this particular, um, this particular effort that, that we have been helping to support. What are the three lessons um, of the last 10 weeks as we learn in real time as, this, um, as we continue to, 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 to do this work? The first one is, like for all um, such efforts, humility is so important and being responsive to what the community and what each community is saying uh, is needed uh, for that particular um, place. And, and what we see in the United States is there's quite a bit of variety, quite a bit of different considerations. Mayors and uh, civic leaders who want to be up front on these issues and others who feel that that's counterproductive to the uh, overall aims of the effort, again, to get cash assistance into the hands of those who aren't receiving any federal, federal aid of any kind. A second lesson, um, which is a, a part of a conversation at the Open Society Foundations that we're having, is the marriage of civic leaders and city government leaders. I'm a firm believer in the potential of the elected, in the confidence that we can have in pragmatic and in um, principled uh, policy leaders. We, had, we heard on, on, on this very platform the mayor of, 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 of Bristol, Martin Reese, who's been very much in the, the media and who's a good friend. Um, and who is one of those people who is both unafraid and who um, has a track record uh, for for these types of types of issues. And another piece of this is that the the is that local governments, local leaders, local elected leaders, I I feel strongly, and I am really curious to hear the views of others, have an obligation to create the types of bridges and conversation um, that are very disruptive in the U.S. context right now, where there's a huge chasm, as everybody knows, between the right and the left, or where, whatever you want to call it. And when speaking with the mayor of Los Angeles, um, Eric Garcetti, on Tuesday, hearing from somebody like that, that with the proper channels and opportunities, there's always um, um, and always a willingness to have those conversations with a more conservative uh, leadership in the United States. The third and final um, observation that I'll, that I'll bring to the floor here is the role of philanthropy when it comes to these major crises such as the pandemic. What is the role of private dollars? What is not the role of private dollars? What can be done and what should be done? And then when is it absolutely necessary and right um, for uh, public support in the form of um, public resources for the types of challenges that we're facing? Thank you. Colleen, thank you very much for sharing with us those lessons. And our next speaker is Vladimir Horvath from the National Democratic Institute, Strengthening Inter-Ethnic Political Discourse and Minority Inclusion Program. Vladimir is a lawyer and human rights activist from Slovakia, who's been active building capacity within civil society for the rights of minorities. And he most recently served as an advisor to Slovakia's only elected member of parliament from the Roma community, a community Vladimir is proudly from and one he seeks to empower 
Vladimir, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. I really, I really want to thank you to be in this, in, in this, in this good company, uh, uh, part of a good society. And uh, as I've seen all, all attendees from uh, all around the world, um, and as I come, as I come from uh, uh, Central Europe, I guess not everybody has to be familiar with the country of 5 million inhabitants that Slovakia is. Uh, if when I talk about Central Europe, I talk about talk mostly about Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, and Slovakia. So if you think about uh, Central Europe, you, 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 you have to imagine pretty homogeneous society, predominantly white, predominantly Christian, and from Christians, the majority are Catholic. What, what, what else is uh, important is to know is that these four countries where uh, I don't want to say behind Iron Curtain, uh, I would rather say on the other side uh, of the wall. We were part of the uh, socialist part of the world. We were under influence of Russia and our borders were, 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 were tightly closed. So uh, this is the mindset here. This is the mindset in Hungary. This is the mindset in Czech Republic and also in Slovakia to much, much extent also in Poland. Uh, and if we, if we talk about inclusion, we mostly talk about inclusion of other national minorities from surrounding countries, meaning Hungary uh, or Western Balkans. Um, therefore, we are not really talk about inclusion in, in, a, in a global perspective, I'm afraid to say, but we are still, uh, we are still on the level of inclusion of mainly one uh, community, which is Roma community. Maybe more of you are familiar with, with the term gypsies. Um, Roma, Roma came to this, uh, to this area around, around 200s to 1500s. We are inhabitants of, uh, of uh, Central Europe for, for ages, as you see, but we are still uh, underprivileged. We, we have uh, still problem to uh, get education. Only, only less, less than 1% of Roma are educated. So you see, if we, if we talking about inclusion, we are dealing with a really homogeneous society having problem to include, um, include one particular group. If I'm talking about one particular group in Slovakia, Roma make up uh, around 7.5 percent of uh, of population, um, which makes up for 450,000 people, and as I mentioned, only one percent have a university degree. You can imagine what does it mean if we translate it to the to the to the representation uh, in local government mainly, or but also in the national government. Uh, it was rightly said that Stefan Wawrega was, was only, only MP in the, in the national government in the previous term. Now we have three. From, from 150, we have three representatives in, in, in the parliament. So with this has been said, um, I think it would be wise to move to a COVID situation. Uh, where I have better news. Uh, we, as a Slovakia, have handled the situation pretty well. However, I have, I have to agree with Yas here that many problems, we, many challenges we had before were exposed. Uh, poverty were exposed. When uh, poverty was exposed in education, when the school closed. Most of students have uh, online lessons and can continue in their education. If we look to the Roma communities, where we, we were still dealing with the problem running water uh, as a country of European Union, you can imagine that it's really impossible to have a good internet connection or, or a notebook or several notebooks for several children uh, at home. So this was the first instance. The second instance, how, how people in Slovakia view Roma community where the reaction 
of the uh, of the of the newly newly elected government, and maybe they even meant it in a good way, but it was communicated as a uh, it was horrifically communicated when they portrayed Roma as a as the as the source uh, of the disease and sent an uh, army uh, military group to some of the settlements. This was the major news on the media and this was how Roma were portrayed. This was only uh, exposure uh, that how people view Roma uh, in our country. Um, to, be more, to be more optimistic, this uh, from, the, from the dangerous group, the government started to portray Roma as a vulnerable group, which was really, really good move. And that, that started initiative from, from uh, private companies, from, from universities, and from other stakeholders. So now we are in a status quo, and now we are trying to, to, to deal with how we can tackle it. The most, uh, the, the one of the issues that come up from this situation and that was exposed was a racial segregation uh, at our schools. And finally, we have a working group on, on, uh, on definition of racial segregation in our schools. And how, finally, we have our, uh, um, let's say separate but equal judgment that we should not be separate, but we should be inclusive. So we are, to, to, to wrap it up, we are uh, at the beginning of inclusive policies and we are look upon you uh, more diverse communities on what we should do, where we should look and what allies we should look for. Uh, thank you. Vlad, thank you so much um, for the work that you do and for providing that context, which is so often um, overlooked and, and not really seen. Thank you so much. Our final speaker today is uh, Samar Ali, uh, an entrepreneur, lawyer, and the founding president of Millions of Conversations, a campaign which seeks to transcend divides and bring Americans together through a shared common values. Samar's international career, far too long to list in, in detail, has spanned 10 years at the White House in South Africa and at the state government of Tennessee. Samar was a White House fellow under President Barack Obama. Uh, Samar is a Winrock International Board member and is an adjunct professor at the Vanderbilt University School of Law. So delighted to have you with us, Samar. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. It's great to be with everyone today. Um, and uh, yeah, Millions of Conversations is a national campaign organized to transcend divides and bring Americans together around commonly shared values in ways that build trust. And we are headquartered right here in the South in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we are primarily focused on undividing America, and we do this in three ways. One, we disrupt toxic cycles of fear, hate, and violence, which I'll get into in a minute about how those cycles work. Two, we work to change the narrative, narratives that demonize the other. And three, we challenge uh, and counter disinformation and misinformation campaigns. So we know that demonizing narratives being used against marginalized communities in the United States is polarizing our country and creating divisions that work against our collective interests. And this is even being intensified this year because of COVID-19, because of natural disasters here in Tennessee, for example, with tornadoes um, that killed over 20 people in, on March the 3rd, because of police brutality. And it's also an election year and we're seeing an uptick in political violence. So we are really seeing these systematic efforts to demonize the other coming together in very um, intense and destructive ways. The way that the cycle works that we're addressing, the cycle of fear, hate, and violence, which is at really the heart of what we're doing to disrupt that cycle, is it starts with labeling of the other. And this labeling of the other in demonizing ways leads to animosity. And the animosity then builds on fear. And the fear leads to blame. And that blame then leads to anger. The anger hardens into hate. And in some circumstances, the hate leads to violence. We aim to disrupt that cycle by not waiting until the hate has already set in, but, I, but I, by addressing it in step one of that cycle, when people use demonizing labels to against the other. 
And I'm gonna give a live example that happened just this morning here in Tennessee as an example of the cycle of hate and fear, hate and violence, how it works and what we're doing to disrupt it. This morning in Sunday's newspaper, there was a full page ad in the Tennessean, which is the main newspaper of tennis in Tennessee. Um, it was an advertisement by the Ministry of Future for America that said, Islam is going to detonate a nuclear device in Nashville, Tennessee. And there were pictures in the ad of Pope Francis and Donald Trump. This is now going viral on Twitter uh, across so many different messengers in different ways, talking about the fear of Islam and inciting violence against Muslims. It started by labeling, by an advertisement that labeled an entire religion and its entire, and entire followers of that faith and religion in very demonizing ways that created fear and is, is inspiring and rather inciting violence. So what we aim to do again is to start from the beginning of countering those demonizing messages that label the other in very harmful ways. And we are working to, strate to strategically create the space online and offline and counter these narratives, um, uh, these narratives that are with negative messaging that are flooding our airways and town halls by reimagining our public square at the county level. We're doing it through messengers that resonate with our audience, with messages that effectively counter the demonizing ones and rather inspire engagement around positive, commonly shared values. This helps us also to counter the authorizing environment for cruelty, which we are currently living and witnessing here in the United States. This is particularly time sensitive work as we are becoming a majority minority country here where everyone in America will effectively belong to a minority group. Knowing that we cannot realize peace that is rooted in a new social contract, which we aim to create before we first see each other's humanity, this work that we're doing has to be the first step in the process in order for America to heal, to realize justice for past wrongs which have never been properly addressed, and to have a real truth and reconciliation process that allows us to believe in a shared future together where we see ourselves in. Being from the South, I can tell you that this is a long overdue effort. Systemic racism has to be unraveled by a systematic approach, and it's that systematic approach that we're committed to. The systematic racism that has been left unchecked in our country is appalling, and Black Americans have been at the end, have been in the, at the end of this brutal system longer than anyone else. This is a moment for us to truly correct course and live up to who we want to be in the world. Everyone has a role to play in this movement, and we hope everyone rises to that occasion. We know that our future depends on it, and here at Millions of Conversations, what we're working to do again is to build the new public square that includes everyone in effective ways that allows us to move forward in a humanizing way that counters these authorizing environments for cruelty. Um, thank you so much. Um, in incredible um, and inspiring to hear the work that you're doing. I'm just going to invite our other panelists to come and join us um, as we now go into our Q&A segment. Um, I'm going to continue to encourage our, pan uh, our attendees to send in your questions. So that, that was incredible. Um, the sheer diversity of, of thought, of ideas, of context that you each bring has been remarkable. So I guess the first question I want to kick off with it is a question that I myself also contend with on a regular basis. What is the balance of your work in disrupting those? So how do you disrupt those that seek to divide versus your work in trying to unite? And how much of your time is balanced doing the two? So maybe I can start with Colleen first. And everybody's on mute right now, so just a heads up. Colleen, forgive me, you're on mute. Just need to unmute you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nisan, and, and, um, and, and that's the question. In fact, I, I, I sent a message because I wanted to ask a similar question to Samar. Uh, I, I love the work that you're doing, uh, Samar, and I see, uh, and, and I love, I'm going to repeat what you said about reimagining the public square um, at the county level, uh, really concrete. Uh, I, I think, that, I think that's, that, that's absolutely right. My, um, my concern um, with the diagnosis that you presented is what we do next. Uh, how do we get away from talking to people 
but bringing them together in a way that they can learn from each other. And I'm going to give you all an example. I know there are many people on this call, so I'm, I'm not going to share any names. But one mayor who's being very criticized uh, for, for uh, the approach to um, the statues, okay, a, a European mayor. And my getting a lot of response from human rights advocates saying, you cannot work with this person. You cannot work with this person. Now, knowing that this person does very well in other policies, understanding that we have to think about ways where you can actually let that person come to the conclusion that they would do in a way that's not about talking to them and it's not about shaming them. And for me, one of them is to bring together with a well-respected peer facing similar challenges, but with a totally different life story. And through that, they, they learn and they construct that. And with the quietness outside social media attention, come to the attention. I believe, I, I've seen that happen. I, can, I believe it can happen. And very quickly on the other point, on the education front, I, I'm so glad you talked about truth and reconciliation, Sama. I totally agree. I'm a Canadian, but a French and American parent. And truth and reconciliation in this country, in the United States, where my children are being raised, and a global perspective to history. You cannot teach kids that they are at the center of the universe and make them responsible citizens of the world. You have to teach them that they are a part of a long, wide story. They contribute to it, but they're not the best. They're not supposed to get to be the best. They are wonderful contributors to humanity. And and it's, 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 you know, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, I'm Colleen, thank you. And answer that question, may Summer, I? Summer, I'm coming, I'm coming to you next. Absolutely. Please awesome. respond to Colleen and also to the, to the broader question of balancing, uh, disrupting division versus promoting unity. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, from, it, it's all a process. So we can't do it all at once. So lots of people want to jump into the healing process. They want to jump into the truth and reconciliation process, but it's a process. And the first step in that process, and Colleen, we're on the exact same page, exactly. We cannot shame people. And that's why our messages and the messengers that we work with have to be people that build trust and don't shame. And they do it in ways that bring people that they can, that resonate with them, that they can relate to, that create the space for, in, for diverse engagement. That is the first step in the process. Before you do healing work, before you do truth and reconciliation work, before you do anything else, because, and I should say, part of my background is as a mediator and as a conflict resolutions practitioner. And when people are in conflict with each other, the first thing that goes is, is seeing each other's humanity. So the first thing you have to put back together is actually that that moment of where somebody comes back from the brink and sees the other's humanity. I've seen it done online and I've seen it done offline. We used to see prior to the fourth industrial revolution of where we have this, you know, where we communicate, um, we, we, we communicate through social media as well. We used to primarily see this work um, in in-person in -person dialogue work. Now we have to do it online and we have to do it offline because the demonizing messages online are working so that once somebody steps back from even that dialogue session of where they've seen the other's humanity and they go back into their echo chamber, a lot of that work gets unraveled. We've seen that you actually have to have these positive messages touching and that not just messages, but with the right messengers, inspiring engagement. These messages have to touch a person at least seven times online. So there has to be a very deliberate and strategic approach, just as there has been uh, behind, for example, the, the group that's, um, that's, um, that's spewing hate in the middle of our Tennessean newspaper this morning, the Ministry of Future for America. They have a lot of money behind them. It's a very strategic approach. They're on the offense. And now in response to their advertisement, we're on the defense. And so what I think we have to really be thinking about here is, what does that process look like? How can we who are trying to inspire unity, which is at the end of the road, it doesn't happen at the beginning of the process, how do we do that in a systematic way? So I'm um, going to stop you right there, forgive me, just because I want to bring Yasser yeah. in. And, and I would love for Yasser to provide thoughts on the systematic way, because I think what we know of the ICC and Six Degrees and the work in Canada, this has been going uh, for a for a good amount of time through the leadership of Adrian Clarkson and John Ralston Saul and others. So love to hear your views, Yasser, on what's been said so far. And also yeah. personally, the balance between um, disrupting division and, and promoting unity. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm going to agree with what Colleen and Summer have said. So I won't repeat, repeat what they've said because I agree with it. But what I would also add, and this is something we encourage people all the time and personally, maybe my background being involved in elected politics is that we encourage people to engage. Um, you know, there's, certain, there's a, has to be a balance between disruption, right? What we're seeing um, as a result of tragedy uh, that took place in Minneapolis with the killing of George Floyd um, and the, the uproar that came out of it, not only in the United States, but across the world, where people started highlighting the injustices that, that are taking against black communities, against indigenous communities here in Canada and, and, and other minority communities, was was an appropriate reaction, no doubt, because people are fed up, right? And part of the pandem pandemic, I think it's, it's, as I said earlier in my opening remarks, that there is this laying, uh, laying sort of um, barely, or I always get confused in the expression, just exposing the fault lines that had existed in the society and people are saying enough is, is enough. But that kind of protest or a movement is just not sufficient. We just cannot end at that and expect that change will take place. Whenever the next election that takes place in our respective communities, at whatever level, even at it at a school board, school district level, we shall go out and vote. We shall run people who share our views and wants to change the system right, at its more foundational or structural level. And this is where I think our failure has been, where we're, we're quick to denounce, we're quick to talk about disruption. We think that we can get online and create a new hashtag and somehow that will gal galvanize people. But when it comes to taking over the institutions, when it comes to getting into the rooms around the tables where decisions are made, and I've said around those cabinet tables where decisions are made, we fail to mobilize. Yeah, so thank that, you for that. Right, that, that's, that's the next balance part, which is extremely important. And I hope we can take this movement to that next level and run candidates that are like-minded, take over city halls and school boards, state and federal legislatures so that we can affect change. Yes, yeah, so thank you. And, and there is a question here and, 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 and Vlad, I'm gonna come to you and, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts and what we've heard so far. Um, in terms of how do you balance, um, especially in a, and I think we don't hear enough about the, the, the context of, of Slovakia and Hungary, and we only hear the top line headlines. So, so in terms of the balance between disrupting division and promoting hate, um, promoting unity rather, I'd love to hear on the ground for you working, especially with the Roma communities, how have you balanced that? Because you, do, you also have worked, as Yasi has said, in a political context. What have been some of the challenges in shifting it from the fringes into the mainstream? Uh, right. Um, again, I have to agree with Yasir that, that the systematic work has to be done. And I'm glad to say that uh, with NDI, we are doing this for more than a decade in Slovakia. Uh, thanks to the uh, NDI program, uh, now we have more than 53 uh, Roma mayors. Now we have more than 500 Roma councillors. This was not the case. We have the best numbers around uh, Central Europe. And this was the hard work. This, was the, this is the work where you have to go local, you have to have your connection, and you have to work with people for, for, for more than just the one rally. So you have to, you, you have to build it up, you have to build, build, your, build up your trust, and then, when it comes to unity uh, in, among Roma, firstly, we have to unite by ourselves. This is, I don't want to criticize just the outside world because it's, it's not comparable, but, but there is a lack of unity within, within our community as well. So what well, we do- Please, I'll let you finish, forgive me, please. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, just want to, I just want to say that without the system in work and without training people, without bringing out from local communities, we cannot have change. And just one remark on, on, uh, on, uh, on the people have enough. The, the message, the clear message by, by voters, by citizens has been sent last elections in Slovakia that 
parties who build their campaign with the anger and the anti far right, uh, I say rallies or protests, didn't end up that well as parties who, st who, who speak only about uh, unity and peaceful solutions and not pointing fingers. So this is the last result from Slovakia. However, far right keep its pers percent. Vlad, Vlad, thank you. Colleen, I know you've answered on the group chat. I want to come to you with um, Stephen Shashua's question. Stephen is a 2015 Yale World Fellow, a, a, a dear friend from the United Kingdom who I've known for, for many years. And, and, and the question he, he asked, and I think the answer would benefit everybody, is um, understanding the disconnect, or is there a disconnect between national and local leaders and through the work that you've done, how, you know, uh, how, how do you, how best can initiatives, maybe community groups plug into that global multi networks that you're talking about, which connects to actually a broader question from Malcolm here, which is, we've heard some really good things. Now, the challenge is all of this, everything that we're trying to combat in terms of building inclusive societies is happening very locally. How do you scale this to be a global enterprise, a global movement? How do you connect the dots? So that question around connecting local and national leaders and scale from Malcolm. Colleen. You're on mute. Very quickly then. I've known Stephen longer than you have. No, I'm sorry. Go on. <laughs> uh, <we're countless> <laughs> Don't start there. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the question. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's some literature on this that's coming out, and that's really exciting. And I would just say that when we talk about the influence and the impact of local leaders, it is the future. There's, a, there's some great articles out on the post-COVID world and how international cooperation will be led by mayors. We know that mayors globally are working on transnational issues like climate. We've always thought that integration and inclusion, uh, coming back to what I said before, is a domestic issue. And therefore, yes, local leaders have responsibility, but it has no international and no transnational bearing. We know that's wrong. At the very least, they learn from each other in terms of good practices. They share with each other. But beyond that, when we look at the economics of integration, when we look at diaspora networks, when we look at development, when we look at humanitarian corridors, humane returns, all of these issues require, require transnational conversation between mayors. And that's why I'm at the United Nations at a table for the first time of negotiators. And the representative of Mexico looks at my friend from Los Angeles and says, let's work together because if I can't work with your national government, I'll work with you. What are we, 16th and 17th GDP in the world? We can work together. That's the trend. That's the trend. Is it perfect? No. Will it be messy? Yes. But it, the trend is in that direction. The other one, and I'll stop there or two very quickly, global leaders. Mayors of global leaders look for the principled, pragmatic ones, work with them. They're not perfect. Um, clear, far from that. But we need leaders. We need the personification of individuals who believe, who have worked, and who want to serve the people. And the last one, the U.S. context. I see such opportunity right now in these nationally hostile contexts at the federal level to, to connect mayors of all cities of all sizes and of political parties together in ways we've never seen before. Because in many places, and this is again, Eric Garcetti three days ago said to me on the phone, sometimes it's the mayor's hat and sometimes it's the policymaker's hat. Right now it has to be the policymaker's hat because this country needs it. And so there's huge opportunity. I'm not sure that's the case. In, in some countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe as well. The Visrard group uh, of international cities who went to Brussels together, the mayors of Budapest, of, of, of Warsaw, of Prague, going together and saying, we stand for inclusion. You might as well fund us directly to get that work done in our cities. Helene, thank you Thanks so much. Uh, I mean, I feel, I feel like, I mean, we're going to have to compete with Steve for Stephen's affection here because Emma also knows Stephen for a long time. Um, but um, Yasser, can I, can I come to you? And actually, before I just come to Yasser, on the, on, on, on the question around reconciling political, national, and local leadership, I also want a, a shameless plug to a previous webinar that Colleen has already referred to, where we looked at, um, do we go to city leadership post-COVID in terms of governance for the world? And Marvin Rees, the mayor of Bristol, led that and it's a great conversation so definitely please check that out on our website. Yasser, just in terms of the question um, from Stephen and broadly the question from Malcolm, how do we scale this work so that it's not just a provincial conversation happening in a mayoralty level or in a province in Canada but rather truly global and I know Six Degrees is an example of the work that you're doing so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on how we scale this. 
Yeah, thank you. And I would say to you that um, building on Colleen's answer that it's, this is not easy work. This is hard work. This is what I refer to as tedious work, which means we have to keep doing it again and again and again and again until people get used to it. And then we stop for a moment and then we start again, 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 because it's just human nature because, you know, people will always find ways by, by sheer ignorance to dislike or blame others. And so this work never ends. And it has to be done at all levels. It has to be done at all levels. It has to be done at the local community level. Um, and then we need to find uh, that scaling, that coalition building um, that could transcend borders. And that's exactly the work we're doing through Six Degrees, which is the global forum for inclusion, uh, a project of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. The, the, the purpose behind Six Degrees is to bring uh, like-minded people from, from thinkers uh, to all the way to activists uh, at a local level and bring them in, in, a, in a room um, and share those best practices to really sort of dissect these issues. How do you affect change? How do you build uh, welcoming, inclusive uh, communities? Give each other the confidence and the voice that we need to do this work. Um, we like to say that we're building a coalition against fear um, uh, through Six Degrees. The work we're doing right now in Canada uh, three cities in Canada, Toronto, Montreal, and Calgary, um, in Berlin uh, as sort of our Eastern European hub, and in Mexico City to focus on Latin America is to build that, that very much that coalition. And in fact, as a result of this pandemic, as so many things are going virtual, it has given us a whole different platform now to actually uh, expand our reach even, even uh, farther. The other thing I will say to you, I, uh, as much as I agree with Colleen about the need to do this work at the, local, at the city level and bringing our mayors uh, uh, together, let's not forget how, how large extent of people don't live in big cities, right? And, and if we just focus on big cities, we may just be uh, preaching to the converted, right? Big cities tend to be by their nature cosmopolitan and diverse where a lot of the smaller communities don't share the same sort of uh, ethos. Um, so it's important that the work's got to transcend beyond those big cities uh, uh, as well. And one of the positions that we have taken, and actually it was inspired by our six de degrees in Mexico City, where Marcelo Abrad, who is the foreign minister of Mexico, came and spoke. And he argued that inclusion should be part of foreign policy. As much as we talk about peace and security, in order to really affect peace and security, you need to build inclusive societies. And that really struck with us because that really spoke to the ethos of the work we're doing at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. So one of our sort of policy agendas, if I can say it that way, is to see how we can put building of inclusive societies as part of a key foreign policy principle. We're starting to see that work and Canada took leadership in that regards at the Organization of American States, where they have added a, a protocol around the need to build inclusive communities. So you're starting to have some level of multilateral conversation uh, around mm. that. I think that partly, I think, Nizam, to your question and, and others who have posed on, in the chat, can help scale uh, these local movements to more a global uh, scale. Yeah, so thank you. And, and Samar, I want to come to you, and, and, and I, I would love for you to pick up, and I know you have opinions because you've worked famously on both sides of the political divide in, in America. So your thoughts on, on, the, on the political conversation will be valuable. D D uh, Delilah, as you've seen, has asked a question um, around agree that we can't shame racists, but a huge part of the problem is the shaming of truth tellers who are doing an important job of calling out racism. This is a powerful tactic to silent the anti-racism efforts. How do we address this better? And, and actually Juan Carlos, part of the team, has also asked a question around for those fighting against mis- and disinformation, wh what is, you know, how do we combat this on the platforms around social media. And I think both of those conversations are, are connected. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. Yes, well, I would just say, um, it's lots of questions in one, but <laughs> first of all, um, I think that one of the ways you address um, polarization in America, particularly with political leadership in America, um, across both sides of the aisle, is you get a chance to connect with the constituents. Um, and so, because political leaders are constantly concerned about what does their base and what do their constituents think. So we have to be sharp on our message, on our message and our messengers and using trusted platforms and mechanisms um, that deliver 
those messages in resonating ways that inspire engagement. And there are ways to do this. We don't have enough time to go into that, but there are ways to do it and to scale. Um, so that's one. Two, I would say we never need to be shaming people, period. Um, and so, but you can shame acts, okay? You can shame the act without shaming the person. Um, you can create the space for someone to change their position. And one of the best ways you do that is by not shaming the person. Um, and so, and by, and by really kind of getting into why we're not going to, why those norms of racism are not going to be tolerated and we need new norms. Um, so that's also what I mean by um, countering these authorizing environments for cruelty. It get, gets to the norms and it gets to the values and it gets to the social contract that everyone enters into together to decide who are we going to be moving forward. And you can't do that with addressing your past, by the way. And that's this is a whole process that we've been talking about. Um, so that's just to kind of get to the Leela's question. And with regards to social media and how we are going to how we're going to use social media as a tool to do this, it gets back to this whole we, we can try to police social media, which is a whole conversation conversation in and of itself. But in the meantime, because that takes a long time to figure out, especially with different different rules around around, I mean, hate speech, there are different, there are different laws around hate speech than there are in Europe. So it's different for each country. But one of the ways in the immediate term that we can be addressing this is by putting out messages with messengers that resonate with the people that we're speaking to through the mechanisms that they trust. Summer, thank you. And and Vlad, I want to come to you about social media and, and platforms in particular, and, and your views in terms of your own work about how big, because I know in, in Slovakia, for example, there are certain platforms that may not be as popular. Can you give us a sense of how the platforms are being used on the issues of, of inclusion or division? Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of social, social media, uh, Facebook is the leader in Slovakia. We don't, we don't, uh, Twitter does not have a base at all. So, um, if you want to, if you want to communicate, you, you do it through Facebook. Uh, first to, to, to adopt, um, this information campaign where far right parties and, uh, they are, they are still doing it. They are, they are doing it mainly through, mainly through Facebook and, Fortunately, we have some activities to tackle this disinformation. Also, some also uh, mainstream mainstream media start to adopt this, and there are there are several several um, um, shows, let's say, that are uh, portraying this false information. So we are trying to handle it somehow. In terms of uh, Roma community, it's. Uh, it's made, it's it's all about Facebook and we have to communicate through Facebook and but the key how to communicate inclusive policies and how to how to make people go on the streets we didn't we didn't sort it out yet right thank you I'm so conscious of time uh, we, we go for an hour we know it's never going to be enough we've heard an incredibly rich array of work being done by our incredible speakers today so I want to end on something hopeful but grounded in practicality <laughs> During this COVID period, and also I would note, I know there's been a couple of questions, uh, and in particular by Mahboub around racism and race. Um, and as a topic, that is something we will seek to cover at a, a future webinar with the Good Society Forum around race equity and the Good Society Forum. So I don't want to um, seem like I'm ignoring this incredibly important moment that we're seeing globally uh, and this topic. Um, but in terms of COVID-19 and, and inclusive and welcoming society, Samar, Yasser, Colleen and Vladimir, I would like to ask you, what's given you hope during this period? We've heard lots about a resetting of minds, people having emboldened empathy. For you personally, is there one or two things that you can share with us that has given you hope for actually building a permanent inclusive set of societies across the world? So maybe I can start with Samar because I saw you nodding first. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, it's... It Humanity gives me hope. I've seen people. I've seen people with face, um, to what we're talking about, and and it works. And I've seen this work in conflict zones around the world, and I'm seeing it work here in the United States. And seeing that gives me hope. I hope we can. I hope we can actually put our energy behind 
um, this as fast as possible because time is of the essence. And also it gives me hope is that um, so many incredible minds and such positive energy, like on this call right now, we're all coming together to talk about this and it's an overdue conversation. So it gives me hope that we're putting our collective energies right now together to troubleshoot one of the biggest issues of the century. Thank you, Samar. And, and Yasser, if I can come to you next. Well, I, I will say, Nizam, that I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful uh, that this pandemic has provided us a, an opportunity to reset. Uh, this has put a break on the, the normal, all the old normal now, an opportunity for us to create the new normal. Let's not the, let's not the creation of new normal take place by the same people who created, were running the old normal, right? And that's our hopeful part. There's an opportunity for us to really redefine how we live our lives, whether it's, it's action on, on climate uh, change, whether it is reconciliation with indigenous peoples around the world, um, whether it is how to build inclusive uh, society. There is an opportunity. We have people's attention to reset our lives um, and let's, let's do it in a manner that actually uh, builds a more better uh, welcoming and inclusive community. So that's, that's where my hope comes in. Um, as I said in a comment earlier, it's hard work. It's not just going to happen by sitting on the sidelines or just hoping for it. We just all have to roll up our sleeves collectively and go to work right now. Yeah, yeah. Vladimir, I want to come to you. What's given you hope during this COVID period for this issue? I will just repeat, I will go with the humanity. And, and hope gives me that most people I meet, meet are, are, are good people and we are, we, are told we are on the same page. So I think, I, think, I hope we are, we are not, I don't want to say fight, but I think I, we are not standing against ma a majority. Uh, and what else gives me hope is the last uh, judgment of uh, U.S. Supreme Court on LGBT rights. So, so let's let's hope that even conservative uh, part of the of the spectrum would would understand that that we have to be more open-minded. So, that that's thank you. thank you so much. And last but by no means is Colleen. What's given you hope during this period? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, and the other Supreme Court decision on the Dreamers, these kids who, born, you know, who, who, who were not born in the U.S. but raised here, um, that's a great decision as well. Two in one week. Couldn't have hoped for more. <laughs> um, what gives me hope is the wisdom of my 50 years um, that hate is bred by fear and that the antidote to fear is love. And that is an education. Um, how it's done uh, is the question, um, but everybody, nobody, um, you know, and anybody um, can be open to it, I think. If the messenger, as Samar was saying, the messenger is right, it's a trusted vehicle. Um, so that's what gives me hope. Colleen, Vladimir, Yasser, Samar, we're so grateful for your time, for your contributions, for the work that you do. We know this is just the beginning of our work together, we hope, for the Good Society Forum, and we're very grateful uh, for it. Thank you so much. Emma, over to you. Thank you, Niz, and thank you to the panelists, and thank you to our audience, especially Stephen Shashua. And please join us again at the same time next Sunday when we're going to discuss how to embed racial equity in the Good Society. Thank you all. Bye-bye.